This speaker is named Neville Johnson. He passed away in um, September of 2020. He saw Jesus almost on every single um, daily basis, physically. He would talk to him, and uh, Lord would sit down and talk with him in the mornings while he was drinking coffee. Um, Lord took him many places, uh, heaven, hell. He would send angels uh, to take him on different missions or, um, around the universe. Um, he was taught by many of the cloud of witnesses, John, Enoch, uh, a bunch of a bunch of, uh, of the cloud of witnesses. Um, he would go on different missions around the world, uh, be translated here and there by the Lord. And uh, he had a really interesting life, and now he's here to teach us. He, um, he's gone. He's, he's working for God on the other side now. But he, he left a lot of messages to teach us how to how to um, get through these last days, because this is the end times, and he's uh, he's like an end time um, messenger of God. So um, try to learn as much as you can, because um, there's going to be a lot of things happening really quickly here in the la uh, in the next 11 years. And you don't want to be taken by surprise. You really want to press in and learn as much as you can so you can be prepared. And um, he's, his website and YouTube channel is called The Academy of Light. And um, you can get lots and lots of good teaching and hear about some of his amazing experiences also, too. This one is called The Presence Driven Church. Welcome once again to the Word for the Week. Today, once again, is, the speaker's name is Neville Johnson, the Academy of Light. We're going to be talking about the presence-driven driven church, presence-driven church, and enduring to the end. You know, Matthew chapter 24, from uh, verse 3 on, it says, and he he sat upon the mind of all of us. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And then they said this, And tell us, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And, uh, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. That was the first thing he said. Then, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. That's already underway today. Um, and you shall hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you not be troubled, for all those things must come to pass. But the end isn't here yet. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in different places. And these shall the beginning of the sorrows, beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And uh, then he goes on to say, And then many shall be offended. Talk to the Christian. Many shall be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. And false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Because the iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. Then he said this, But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And only then will the end come. So, Jesus is warning us here about the things that are coming as we come down to the end of the age. And the inference here is that it's important that we endure the times that lie ahead of us. We're not going to be sailing through them, you know. It's, 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 it will be a time we have to endure. <clears throat> and the word endure here comes from the Greek word, a Greek word which means to stay, to remain behind to remain, to abide, to endure, you see? And so there are certain qualities needed for us to make it to the end. And uh, so 
And finishing our course, you know, the, it is a race we are in, but it's not about who's first over the line. It's a race of endurance. It's an endurance race, finishing the course. We finish it, endure and finish it to the end. And, um, you know, what is needed for us to endure? And so I want to talk to you about the presence-driven church. Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 15. He said to Peter, whom, he said unto them, but whom say you that I am? Who do you say that I am? So, Matthew 16, 16, Peter said and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. All right. Peter was really quick off the mark. He said, Oh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, O Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father which was in heaven. In other words, what you just said was really important came from heaven. Then he said this, and I say unto you, thou art Peter, and his name is in the, in the Greek was Petros, Peter, and it means just a little stone. That he said, upon this rock, Petra, which means a massive rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he said, I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So Jesus, Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? And so Peter was first off the mark and said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And the Lord replied, he said, you know, you are Peter, Pet, a little rock. But this rock, Petra, a massive rock, this rock, this reality, on that I will build my church. Now, we, we need to understand this. Peter was just a little rock, but he said, on what you just said is a massive rock, on which I will build my church. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So, the statement of Jesus is profound. Understanding what Jesus was saying here is critical to understanding the character of the end-time church. Now, Peter, you are a little stone, but what you said is a massive rock, and it came from heaven. I will build my church on the living reality of this manifest reality that I, Jesus, are the son of the living God in the midst of the church. Okay? Now, remember, Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, you were born and had patience and and have not fainted, nevertheless have somewhat against you, because of this you're losing your first love, you're losing my presence, and I'm, re I'm removing a candlestick, the presence of the Lord. That'd be scary. And, you know, when Jesus is not central in our lives and in the church, his presence is removed. As we moved down, you know, to the last of the letters, we came to the Laodicean church. We saw that. He said, I stand at the door and knock. He was on the outside of the church. You know, the Ephesian church began to lose its first love. The presence of the Lord went into apostasy slowly but surely. Uh, the many, you know, different phases until Jesus was on the outside of the church. They were continuing with church, but his manifest presence was not there. You see, we've seen different phases in the church over decades now. You know, discipleship, that, that was a phase the church went through. Then seeker-sensitive, the seeker-sensitive church, that was a bad one. The user-friendly church, that was a bad one. The power emphasis. Then there was the purpose-driven church. See, eventually all of these failed. Failed to reach the dynamic that is truly life-changing and enduring. That is Jesus in the midst of the church. It's interesting, when David was on Mount Zion with the tabernacle of David, there was an open heaven and the glory of the Lord the other way. Quite a number of miles away, the priests were still going through the rituals in the temple. 
but he wasn't there. They were going through everything, all of the ritual, but David was up here on the mountain where the presence of God was. The rituals were still continuing in the church, but he wasn't there. The ark of God's presence, you see, was on Mount Zion. Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, because my living presence will be the rock of that church, the end time church. You see, we have programs without end in the church. Good music, maybe good organization, many programs, but if we don't have the living manifest presence of the Lord in our churches, all we have is a club. Emphasis establishes priorities. What our emphasis is will establish priorities. And priorities will establish the outcomes. So what our emphasis is will eventually determine the outcomes. You see? It's interesting, you know, you know the gifts of the Spirit can operate for a while even if the presence of God is not there. That's very clear in the Scripture. So the presence-driven church is going to be the only church that will survive in these end times. So we must seek, ask, knock for the Lord's manifest presence. You know, he said, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. And I've noticed that people who are saved in the atmosphere of a presence, a manifest presence of the Lord, they start on a very strong foundation. We must seek his presence. Very, very important. We must have the presence of the Lord in the church, the dynamic presence. So what do we have today? Where are we going today? It is the presence-driven driven people and the presence-driven church that's so important. And so we need to understand it, that we're entering the kingdom age. We're in a new phase in the church. And it takes the manifest, going to take the manifest presence of God in our churches for the harvest to begin to come in. If we don't have the manifest presence of God, nothing is really going to happen. You know, holiness is a result of God showing up as a refining fire and so on. You see, you can't talk people into holiness. Holiness appears, starts to appear in the church when the manifest presence of the Lord is in the church. It takes that. You see, it takes the manifest presence of the Lord to reveal the darkness and clean up his people. He can come as fire. That's the manifest presence of the Lord. He can come as deep healing, stillness. He can come as a warrior. That's when he's there in the manifest presence as a warrior. Demons begin to manifest in people. But see, if we don't have the manifest presence of God, literal manifest presence. We only have a club. We need to seek his presence and ask for his grace. And that's very important. We must, must seek, ask, knock, abide in his presence. And so what kind of churches have we? Are we? In the end times, you know, we won't survive as a church unless we have the manifest presence. I mean, his presence manifests, the felt presence, the manifest presence. And, you know, we as individuals won't survive unless we walk in that either. Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Mahost eye, abide in that place, will be covered, will be safe. You know, in the 1970s, early 1970s, I saw an earthquake that would occur in Japan. And it was an earthquake of 9.1 on the Richter scale. And uh, I noticed that the fallout would be in 
unbelievable. The fallout was worldwide because the stock exchange in Tokyo collapsed and the ripple went around the world. And I said, Lord, this, why are you showing me this? What is about? He said, when this happens, Psalm 91 is where you must be living or you will not survive the days ahead. Psalm 91 is, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of his wings. You know this psalm. And uh, dwelling in the secret place, the manifest presence. This is something we have to understand and enter into. Now, in Romans chapter 8, in verse 2, it reads like this. For the law of the spirit of life. See, there's a law here. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you, me free from the law of sin and death. Now, this is a law. Like gr the gravity is a law, the law of gravity. It's a law. If we do something, this law comes into place, then these are the results. All right. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For years, you know, I pondered this scripture and thought, well, what does that really mean? And I had very little insight, but, you know, the law of the spirit of life. What is that law and how does it work? Well, first, we understand Jesus is the spirit of life. Everything that he touches brings life. And everything that touches him brings life. Remember the woman who just touched the end of his garment and was healed? Everything he touches brings life. Every, everything that touches him brings life. You see, when Jesus is in our midst in a tangible way, the law of the spirit of life comes in operation. But it only comes into operation when Jesus is in our midst tangibly, a felt presence. And so it's important that we really understand this. You know, only what we see, only what we are aware of is real to us. When we are aware of the manifest presence of the Lord, that there is a transference takes place from him to us. Only what we are aware of is real to us. The power, you know, of awareness is very little understood. But once we're aware of the manifest presence of the Lord, a transference is taking place between us. That's the law. The manifest presence is the law that operates the spirit of life into us. And so it's important to understand that. You see, Enoch walked with God in a state of awareness of the presence of, of the Lord that he would still be alive today if the Lord hadn't taken him. And so we need to understand that. Now, you know, John, the apostle, was a very interesting. Of all of the apostles, John was the most interesting. He was boiled in oil, but he was so full of life, he just got out and walked away. <coughs> now, he came out praising God, so they didn't know what to do with him. So they banished him to the Isle of Patmos, where he had, of course, the, the Revelation and wrote the book of Revelation. He was very different to the rest of the apostles, very different. You know, there is a number of scriptures that refer to John in this way. In John thirteen twenty three, he says, Now there was leaning on Jesus, one whom is... The, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. Well, didn't Jesus love the rest of the disciples? Yes, but he loved John in a very different way. He's, he loved John as a special friend, and it was different. You see, again in John 21.10, then Peter, turning about, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was talking about John. Why did he say that? To whom he's Seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved was laid upon his breast and said, Which is he that betrayeth you? Now, that little phrase, then Peter turning, seeing the disciple whom Jesus loved. Why did he say that? John was very different 
to all of the others. So then, John 21, 21 says, Peter seeing him, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Okay, I'm not sure why he said that. But Jesus said unto him, verse 22, If I tarry, if he will tarry till I come, what is that to do with you? You follow me. Now it's an unusual thing to say. If I, if, if I will that he tarry till I come, well, where's he coming from? It's talking about the second coming. What is that? Then it goes on in verse 23. Then went the saying abroad among the brethren that the disciple John would never die. Yet Jesus said not unto them, he shall not die, but he said, if he tarry till I come, what is that to you? So there's a mystery here. Actually, John did not die. Um, there's no record of his grave. There's no record of his death anywhere in history. His grave has never been found. He was translated um, like Enoch. I have met John, met John in heaven. And John was one of the last of the apostles. When he had the experience where he wrote, wrote the book of Revelation, all of the other apostles were dead, long dead. Paul was dead, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or the whole lot were dead. Jerusalem didn't even exist. It was, had been raised to the ground. So he was living in a different world. And believe me, he was very old. And he had never died. He never had all of his apostles were dead, but he was still around. You know, the, there is a prophetic significance to all of the deaths of the apostles. And John was the last. He will endure to the end. For many years, there's been an emphasis on the Pauline epistles, which is good because there's some incredible revelation that Paul wrote about. Um, and it's good, but in these last days, the emphasis will shift onto John's writing of the you know, Gospels that John wrote and the Epistles that John wrote. And there are many keys to be found in his writings. The secret of John's relationship with the Lord and his walking in the fullness of life are found in his writings. There are end time secrets found in John's Gospel, which are not found in any of the other Gospels. He found a way to live in the law of the spirit of life, which made him free from sin and death. You see, the secret place of the Most High is a spiritual place of awareness and consciousness of the Lord. And so we need to understand that. You can be constantly aware of the Lord at all times, but it takes discipline. You can dwell in the secret place of the Most High, the secret place, the awareness of the Lord, the conscious awareness of the Lord at all times. This is a discipline we have to learn. If you have to know where that place is, you don't know how to enter it. It's a real place where you meet with the Lord. The secret place is your, in your spirit. The natural man cannot take you there. All right? You have to find the bridge between your soul and your spirit to dwell in that realm constantly. You see, we are told in Scripture, when we turn our heart to the Lord, the veil is removed. Mm -hmm. So, okay... In 2 Corinthians 3.15 it says, But even to this day when Moses was read, there's a veil over the heart of the Jewish people. Nevertheless, when it, what's the it? When it, the heart shall turn to the Lord, the veil will be removed. Now, the separation between the holy place and the holiest of all, there was a veil which was about this thick. That was thick, you couldn't tear it with the natural hands. And uh, he's saying, but, that veil can be removed. It's a spiritual principle. When the heart is turned to the Lord, and so the question remains, what's the, what is the heart? Well, that's not easy to explain. 
obviously it's not this, the physical heart, we know that. There is a veil, you see, between, but when the heart is the Lord, the turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. What is your heart? That's a difficult question. You know, Jesus said in Mark 12, 30, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, which means with all your soul, your mind, and your strength. This is the first commandment. You know, the heart, our thoughts, our feelings, our soul, our emotions. Mark 12, 30, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. How do you love the Lord with your mind? I mean, it's, what's that mean? Well, that word mind is a Greek word, dianoia, dianoia which means, Imagination. You must love the Lord with all your heart and with your imagination and with all your strength. That's the first commandment. You see, there's a bridge, your imagination. What you imagine is real to you. People say, oh, it's just my imagination. Yeah, what you imagine is real to you. Turning your heart, use the use of the imagination, the Hebrew word is yetzer. You know, it says like in Isaiah 26, Thou will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the Lord. So, mind, imagination, is stayed on the Lord. Yet, sir, it's an interesting Hebrew word and uh, it's important to understand it. And so we're talking about now a presence-driven church, the Trevens presence-driven person, if remaining in the secret place of the Most High, an awareness, conscious awareness of the Lord through our spirit, the hidden man of the heart. You know, we have a spirit in the inner man. When, the la when is the last time you were aware of your spirit? This is how it works. The law of the spirit of life shall set you free from the law of sin and death. The presence driven church. If we do not have the literal, tangible presence of the Lord in our churches and in our personal lives, we will not survive what is coming. But if we do have it, we will begin to change. Just like John changed, he was different to the other apostles. Cross over to another realm. To include the Lord in everything you do. Be aware of him. This is the law of the spirit of life. Let's be closed by saying, every time you consciously connect with the Lord, his life flows into you. That's the law of the spirit of life. An infusion takes place. And you do that by turning your heart, your mind, your imagination, that other realm. God gave you your imagination so you could imagine. Turning your heart, your imagination to the Lord. Constantly through the day, that is when you remain under the shadow of the Almighty. Only the presence-driven church will survive in the coming days. And in order to endure to the end, we have to learn to live in His manifest presence. God bless you.